Mr. Chairman, Professor, you know, in a trial, there's an exchange of evidence back and forth. What we see here today, we've presented evidence. I mean, the other side is a lot of bluster and theatrics. And also in a trial, you have affirmative defenses. I think the only affirmative defenses that are coming from the other side is, one, Donald Trump, like the ultimate affirmative defense that you could just say his name and all wrongdoing is gone away. I mean, uh, Lisa McLean talked about this earlier, that he is living in their head. I would also submit to you that he's tap dancing in their head because that's all that they talk about. The second affirmative defense, according to the Democrats, is this magical shutdown clock that they have. But would it surprise you that every single appropriations bill that has tried to come before the floor, they have voted? They don't want to debate on government funding. They want to shut down the government. This is the kind of stuff that they're doing. And of course, the third affirmative defense, as you well know at this point, is attack the witness. Right? You don't have the facts, you don't have the law, you have theatrics and you just go after the witness. It's like we live in amnesia, like they have this constant amnesia. We have statements from the ranking member about you don't need a vote on the floor, but that's what they talk about. You know, for the past nine months, we've worked tirelessly to analyze all the evidence. Every single week, there's more evidence that drops. And this is despite the FBI. This is despite the DOJ. We have witness interviews, accounts of confidential human sources, whistleblower testimony. They haven't disputed that at all. Bank records, suspicious activity reports, text messages, WhatsApp messages. It's endless. And despite what my friends on the other side of the aisle may say, House Republicans have always held that this investigation should follow proper procedure and be done the right way which is why we're here today. We know that Biden family members were complicit in and benefited from Hunter Biden's foreign business dealings. And as the lens begins to focus, and as the evidence begins to mount, we uncover more and more about Joe Biden's involvement. Today, I wanna to focus on the FD 1023, a document that shows a conversation between a confidential human source and a Ukrainian business executive, Mykola Zlochevsky. Let's dive into a few key points. The, the source asked Lachevsky about the Ukrainian prosecutor's investigation into Burisma. He replied, don't worry, Hunter will take care of all these issues through his dad. Two, although Hunter Biden was labeled as stupid, that, that the, the guy's dog was smarter than Hunter, the source was told in 2016 that Hunter Biden was brought onto Burisma's board to protect them. Three, big fact, Hunter and Joe Biden both told Lachevsky that he should keep Hunter Biden on the board. And of course, he received a million dollars a year. Point four, after the elections, Lachevsky said it cost $5 million to pay one Biden and $5 million to another, meaning Joe Biden. And point five, in 2019, Lachevsky said he didn't send any funds directly to the big guy. wonder what that means. We've talked about that a lot today. Because according to Lachevsky, it would take investigators 10 years to find the records of payments to Joe Biden's. If these allegations are true, and there's... There's a reason why it was so hard to put together. This was done deliberately and on purpose. So we're here months later. We finally get this document released to the public. Mr. Turley, what in your eyes is the most serious allegation outlined in the FD 1023? Well, first of all, the, I'm not someone that puts a great deal of, of emphasis on these types of field reports from uh, from sources, but this was not just any source. This was a source that was not just trusted, but it received a considerable amount of money from the FBI and had a long track record. So it does come with that degree of, of support. What I think an inquiry has to do is to drill down on the 1023. It, there may be nothing there when you drill down, but there may be bribery. And of course, that's the second offense uh, that is mentioned for impeachment. But what makes the 1023 concerning is the overall context. And this is one of the reasons why when, when Representative Goldman was asking me about bribery, it's a little more complex because you have Section 201, you've got the Hobbs Act, and you have all these cases that suggest uh, that, that it is public corruption in a lot of different forms. So really, you're sort of at the water's edge here. Everything that has gone so far, from what I can see, has been tracking money from banks, often transnational uh, uh, transactions, that have arrived at the United States. What, what we haven't seen is the, the back end of those, those transfers. To what extent can you track that money uh, with regard to the Bidens themselves? And that, I suppose, will come out through an, an inquiry. But until you have those interstitial relationships, you don't quite know what you have. Professor, how can we use this document 
and maybe other documents that we have to expand the case? And how pivotal do you think that this document is to the case? Well, I think that in an inquiry, when someone who is trusted by the FBI suggests that there was actual bribery uh, involving the president, you need to uh, contact everyone involved, including the source for the 1023, but also this is secondhand information. So you're going to have to pursue uh, the references made by that source, and you do it in good faith and to see if there's a there there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Without a yield back. Chair, Mr. No, Chair recognizes Chairman, Mr. I'd like to make a motion for unanimous consent. For what? Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, I ask for unanimous consent to enter into the record a Washington Post article titled The Republican Case Against Biden Takes a Body Blow from Fox News Because They Failed to Show Any Connection and Their Evidence uh, Is Too Far Down the Path to Admit That They Are Wrong. Without objection. Chair recognizes Mr. Edwards. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd just like to start out uh, by commenting while this is not directly affecting this uh, impeachment inquiry, I am so excited to have heard so many times from that side of the room how concerned folks are over keeping the government running because you're all going to get a chance in just a few hours to, uh, to put your money where the, your mouth is and vote on some bills that's going to keep the government funded. And I hope it's as important to you when you go to cast those votes as what you've said that it is this afternoon. We've heard today that how many times Joe Biden has lied. He's lied about his role in his family's business dealings. We've also heard how in the White House uh, he's struggled to keep up with new evidence about consistently shifted its uh, messaging on President Biden's involvement in Hunter Biden's foreign business affairs. This summer, White House spokesperson Ian Sams shifted the White House's messaging to now claim that President Biden was never in business with his son. This is dramatically different than what we heard from the White House in their previous claims where we were told that President Biden had no knowledge of Hunter Biden's business dealings. And yet again, the committee has revealed evidence that then Vice President Biden had direct knowledge of and involvement in Hunter Biden's foreign business dealings. Kenneth uh, Rock, uh, Rakishev is a uh, Kazakhstani oligarch who was a director at Kazakhstan's state-owned oil company. Importantly, Rakishev maintains ties to Karim Mazamov, who became Prime Minister of Kazakhstan on April 2nd, 2014. On April 22nd, 2014, Rakishev wired $142,300 to an account associated with Hunter Biden, Rosemount Seneca Bohai. The next day, that same amount was sent to a car dealership in New Jersey for an expensive sports car for Hunter Biden. Around the same time as the payment for Hunter Biden's sports car, then Vice President Biden attended a dinner with Kenneth Rakishev's, uh, Kenneth Rakishev, Kareem Mazamov, Yelena Baturina, Hunter Biden, and Devin Archer at Cafe Milano in Washington, D.C. I believe that uh, we have a photo of those here. There they are. And here, on another screen, we see a photograph with Mr. Mazamov on the right standing with Joe Biden and Hunter Biden along with Mr. Rakashev on the left. I don't know if that picture came up or not. Uh, additionally, in April 2015, then Vice President Biden attended another dinner in Washington, D.C. with Prime Minister Mas uh, Masimov, Hunter Biden, and Devin Archer. Clearly, Hunter Biden was selling the Biden brand and all the access and political favors that came along with it. 
This transcript, I believe we're going to see it come up on the screen, is taken from the committee's interview of Devin Archer earlier this summer. In this excerpt, Archer reveals that then-Vice President Biden hosted Hunter Biden, Archer, and Mark Holtzman, who was then the chairman of Kazakhstan's largest bank, for breakfast at the Naval Observatory, where Holtzman discussed who was going to be the next U.N. Secretary General with Vice President Biden. Mr. Holtzman was lobbying for Kareem Masimov to receive the position. That meeting occurred on July 7, 2015, shortly after Vice President had dined again with Masimov at Cafe Milano in Washington, D.C. Was Masimov trying to cash in? After all, a meeting with Vice President of the United States when trying to become U.N. Secretary just might be worth it for a sports car. And around that same time, Hunter Biden and Devin Archer were pursuing energy projects in Kazakhstan on behalf of the corrupted Ukrainian energy company Burisma, which was trying to expand its business into the country. This is another clear example of Hunter Biden peddling access to his father and Joe Biden participating in the influence peddling scheme. Hunter seeks business opportunities in a foreign country and provides access to and political favors through his father's office to get paid. Mr. Chair, I see I'm out of time, so I'll yield. Gentlemen, time.